Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Pandemic Classroom. I'm your host, Mr. Woods. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the Roman Republic, as well as the origins of, of ancient Rome. And uh, we'll work our way all the way up to um, Idus Martii, or the Ides of March. So, without further ado, let's carry forward. So, Roma in Italia est. Roma in Italia est. So, Rome, as it uh, states there, is in Italy. Uh, Rome is in Italy. It's located on the Italian peninsula, otherwise known as the Apennine Peninsula. And Rome, as a civilization, or Italy, uh, larger as a as a country, is very centrally located in the Mediterranean. So when you're looking at a world that doesn't have airplanes uh, and sea trade, is it's pretty much how everything uh, carries about being located in about the center of you know the, the biggest uh, sea in that region. Uh, you know that. The, kind of shares the border of three continents that's a a good place to be right centrally located they can reach western europe uh, eastern europe the middle east uh, or, or asia there and then uh, the entire coast of north africa just a short jump away so that being said uh, italy's location made it a prime uh, place for a large civilization to develop now the city of rome it's located, kind of nestled among these seven different hills, um, to the seven hills of Rome. Uh, the big ones, Aventine, Palatine, and Capitoline Hill, and then uh, you have Caeline, uh, Esquiline, Quirinial, and Viminial, uh, or Viminial, for speaking Latin. Uh, Rome is protected from invasion uh, due to these large mountains located in the north, known as the Alps. Uh, so the Alps basically extend all of this region up here. Um, we may know them as the Swiss Alps. Of course, they're that if you're in Switzerland, which is just north of the Italian peninsula here. Uh, Rome itself, you can see uh, located right here on what's known as the Plains of Latium. And then uh, right next to Rome... Uh, flowing down out of those Apennine Mountains, you have the Tiber River. Uh, the Tiber River is incredibly important because Rome is not built directly on the coast. Uh, it's, it's a few miles inland. So the Tiber River is what gives them access to the sea, but also helps protect them or insulate them from any kinds of invaders. Uh, so they have the sea around the peninsula. They have the, the mountains to the north, uh, which, of course, the the Alps are thought to have only ever been crossed by Hercules. So that's a pretty safe border. Uh, and then the, the Tiber River providing you some protection there as well. So the founding of the Roman city. Um, so Rome is both a civilization and a city and i guess in there you could refer to it as a culture as well uh the legendary start date for the city of rome is april 21st 753 bc uh, what the romans would have called ad orbe canditum or the founding of the city uh so romulus and remus these two brothers whom you see pictured here um of course you know uh the children of rea silvia and mars um, raised by the she wolf lupa and um, you know, taking over the kingdom of Alba Longa. Hopefully you've read the story that I provided. Uh, and that kind of gives you some insight into early Roman culture and, and sort of where uh, these early Romans are coming from. Now, this is only one side of the story, of course, because you know, the founding of Rome, also you know, the kingdom of Alba Longa, all of that, located here in this text known as the Aeneid, recorded by the Roman poet uh, Virgil, um, tells the story of you know, the kind of Trojan succession into Rome. Uh, so, you know, you have Romulus and Remus, and of course they, they, they fight or scuffle briefly, uh, Remus being killed by his brother Romulus, whom the city is named for. Um, now, these uh, these early influencers of Roman 
history, the Latins. That's where the language is going to come from. Of course, part of that language is also going to be borrowed from a group known as the Etruscans. Uh, they're going to get monarchy. The Etruscans are going to influence with architecture and their culture and much of the, the, the early rites for women. And then the Greeks are going to bring in you know, their religion, uh, their art, and their alphabet is actually going to, to help shape the, the Latin or Roman alphabet. So the Latin phrase cave rex, or beware of kings, is here uh, to tell us a little bit about early Roman history. So um, those Indo-European tribes, the Latins that settled along the Tiber River, uh, they brought with them some, some laws, uh, a body of, kind of early laws that applied to all people, uh, known as the Latin Rite. So you had the right of Comercium, Canubium, Immigratio. So Comercium is the right to trade, the right to commerce. Uh, Canubium is the right to marriage. And Migratio is the right to migrate or the right to move. So these are known as the Latin Rite. And it's kind of three fundamental laws uh, that the people of Latium or the early uh, Latin people enjoyed. You had kings introduced. Uh, so early Roman kings, there's seven of them. Uh, they reigned for about 200 years from uh, uh, 750s to uh, the early 500s. And the last king of Rome, uh, a guy named Tarquinius Superbus or Tarquin the Proud, uh, is, is overthrown um, by a guy known as uh, Lucius Brutus. No. Hang on to that name because it's going to be more important later. Um, and he is um, he's overthrown for a couple of different reasons. Uh, he's accused of um, of raping a noble woman uh, named Lucrezia, and uh, you know the family is of course upset. Uh, she ends up killing herself uh, out of this, and this becomes quite the uh, quite the story in ancient Rome. But it's more about kings abusing their power, uh, which leads to him being overthrown by the people. Res publica, or the business of the people, the Roman Republic, uh, established in 509 BC, and it is a form of government known as a representative democracy. So people don't hold the power directly, they elect officials who hold the power on their behalf exactly the type of system we have in the United States. Um, the Romans had three branches of government, same as we do. So the problem is, is you know, kind of who gets to be a citizen of this um, and, and how does that work? So full citizenship is limited to men only. Um, men who pay their taxes and who completed military service. So that's the only way you get to be a citizen. Uh, if you are a patrician, uh, one of the founding families of the city, you are part of the wealthy upper class. That's the only way you get to hold most of the political offices. The plebeians, which are kind of like the middle and lower class, uh, could have some offices. You know, if they have money, they might be able to hold some of the classes. Now, that wealth disparity is not always going to be there between patricians and plebeians, but it kind of becomes a where'd you come from. So there's patricians, which are like the old money rich, and the plebeians, who, you know, even though some of them become quite wealthy, are never seen as the same status. And then you have slaves as well. Um, these are tended to be prisoners of war, um, or people who are born into slavery from current existing slaves. And then there's also debt slavery, which occurs in Rome. If you owe enough money, you're enslaved until that's paid off. So we have this figure here, uh, Lucius Quinctus Cincinnatus. And if you're familiar with the city of Cincinnati, uh, it's not too far from us here in the Pittsburgh area. Yeah, it's named for Cincinnatus. Sorry to say that it's a city in Ohio that's named for him. I think you may know how I feel about Ohio. Uh, he is a legendary figure in Roman history. He is a dictator, which is an appointed position in the Roman Republic. In time of crisis, uh, you would be appointed dictator. 
uh, which means you'd be given essentially absolute power for a period of about six months um, to do whatever you needed to do to you know, face the threat of Rome, and then you would you know, kind of hand that power back over. Um, so this is something that, that Cincinnatus uh, holds very dearly, uh, twice actually in Roman history. And he is known for kind of wielding this power, taking care of the threats of Rome, and then giving this power back over to uh, the, the Roman Senate. Um, he is a hero of you know, probably our most famous figure, George Washington. Uh, and it kind of gives you a little bit of insight. If you think about George Washington, he kind of you know, fought this revolution, had this immense power given to him. He's the only president who's elected unanimously. It's not really an election. Um, so George Washington becomes president, and he could have remained president. He could have become a king. He had that much power given to him. And yet, at the end of his second term, uh, he gave that power up and returned to his farm. You know, That's the story of Cincinnati as well. Uh, goes back to his farm. So we have the 12 tables. 12 tables are uh, some concessions that are given to the plebeians. So the plebeian peoples uh, would rebel against the Romans. You know, this is how you kind of fight injustice. You, you have a rebellion, you kind of throw your weight against the, the powers that be, and eventually to establish peace, there's going to be some form of concession. You go back to living your life the way you were, uh, and, and in return, we'll give you a few uh, a few things that you're asking for. Uh, the plebeians would do this historically several times to, to wedge themselves into positions of power in Rome. Uh, and, and you still see that type of thing happen today. It's why we protest. It's why we have marches. It's why we, we have these movements. You know, we, we uh, rebel against the powers that be and hope to get some concessions in return. So the 12 tables are a codification of laws. So Roman laws had existed. They had always been around. But you may not know what the law says, and the law could be bent or twisted as it needed to be. Uh, and so this was a way of trying to you know, put the law down in print where everyone has access to it to make sure that nobody is twisting the laws to their own benefit. So the 12 tables were, were hung in public, uh, and they're carved in bronze, and they're there for everyone to have access to. They're displayed in the Forum in Rome is you know, the central marketplace. Uh, if you remember when we discussed Greece, we talked about the Greek Agora, right? the marketplace of a Greek city-state. In Rome, it's the forum. That's the marketplace. That's the center for, for politics. It's, it's everything. It's the, the heart of Rome. And you know, over time, uh, the plebeians do begin to gain more equal rights. So let's talk about these Roman branches of government shall we? Here in these uh, nice artistic photographs, actual photographs, by the way. Yes, I'm kidding. They're not real photographs. Uh, these are the Roman consuls. So unlike our government, you know, we have one president. Um, and then, of course, his appointed cabinet, the retinue that follows that, and all the offices that he gets to hand out. So there's there's quite a few uh, people in our executive branch, but there's one chief power, and that's the president. Um, the consul is the highest elected office in Rome. So, of course, these people are elected. They're not appointed to office. There's two of them at any given time, and they serve one-year terms. So you are only consul for one year. Now, you could be consul five or six times in your life. It just has to be 10 years in between. Uh, so if you think about our president, right, our president is uh, two terms, two four-year terms that you can serve, um, or 10 years. Because if you're a VP who takes over, you know you could serve nine or, or maybe up to ten years, finishing out that term and being reelected on your. Anyway, that's that's all messy. Two terms is what uh, our presidents get uh, of four years each. It's been that way since the the forties when the laws were rewritten after FDR held you know, three plus terms. He right? got elected to a fourth, but that one didn't last very long. So Roman consuls hold one-year terms, but those terms can, can 
can repeat after 10 years. Um, <laughs> they hold the power of veto over one another, so they can veto one another's decisions, uh, and they are there to be kind of a check on one another, um, and you know that that checks that power to make sure that they don't have you know a runaway power with one console. So uh, now, how much can you accomplish in one year? Right, that's kind of the the way of limiting danger. If, if you think about the Roman Republic. Every decision that is made in government, all the way up to the assassination of Julius Caesar himself, every decision that is made is out of this existing fear, this terror of ending up with a king again. The Romans hate kings. They built their republic to repel kings, to be the opposite of having a king. You know, that's the thing that they're afraid of. That's the reason they built the government the way they do. That's why everything they do operates the way it does. It's why the symbols that they put in place, um, you know, the, the, the fasces, we talked about this back when we talked about fascism, but the fasces, the bundle of sticks representing the unity uh, of many parts making the strength. And then the axe, right, the executive power, axes that they would use to lop off the heads of kings uh, and criminals alike. So it's that, that power to make a decision. Um, but, the, but you know some of the things that they wouldn't allow. They wouldn't allow people to wear purple. Uh, they wouldn't allow um, kind of the the laurel wreaths to be placed upon the head of the consuls because it represented kingship, and that was something they didn't like. Kind of the same reason we chose that branch of government or that style of government as well, right? What did we fight a war against? The American Revolution was against the King of England. For opposed kings, go to the Republic. So the Praetors uh, is kind of like the judicial branch. Uh, eight men, also one-year terms, chosen from the people. They're like judges slash commanders. They, they, they have kind of a strange and very flexible position, but they are the ones who are responsible for upholding the laws of Rome. So they're not enforcing, but they're upholding the law. Right? That's that judicial power. Same thing that our judicial branch does. Difference is, of course, that our Supreme Court uh, the term is until retirement or life, until you die. Okay, now as you can see, this one gets quite messy. Representation, right? The, the Congress, the legislative body of Rome. So our Congress in the United States is made up of a Senate and a, a House of Representatives. Right? The Senate is a, a static number of two senators per state. So we have 50 states. Therefore, we have 100 senators. Uh, the House of Representatives changes based on how many people are in a state and what sort of representation it gets. Uh, so different states have different numbers of representatives, and it's based on population. So we have, uh, I believe it's 435 members of the House of Representatives. Um, and so, you know, they, they would be the, the more popular representation of the people. So when we look at Rome, uh, not so unlike ours, right? The Senate has uh, 300 senators, so it's a little bit larger than our Senate, and they hold a lot of the same powers that our Senate does as well, right? They, they control uh, foreign uh, interaction as well as uh, the financial policies. Uh, they you know, advise the executive branch. They advise the consul. Now, the big difference is the Senate uh, positions are held for life. And most senators in ancient Rome are patricians. So these would be positions that are almost passed down from father to son. Uh, then you can have the assembly. Uh, so the assemblies are made up of three different groups. Just like ours, our uh, House of Representatives is made up from all the different states. These assemblies are made up from different groups as well. So we have the Centurion Assembly, uh, which are those citizen soldiers. Uh, they help select the consuls, make laws. The Tribal Assembly. Rome had you know, these different tribal groups. Um, that's kind of like the group according to where you live. Uh, they elect the tribunes, which are people that have uh, a veto power, and they make the laws. And then that, that college of tribunes, they have the power to veto, uh, and they also help to protect the rights of the plebeians. What's interesting, I think, about the, the tribunes, you know, their, their veto power uh, is, is very different. So veto is a Latin word, means I forbid. So if a, you know, a tribune were present 
<clears throat> during a discussion in the in the this representative body in the assembly, and they start talking about something that's going to be you know bad for the the, the plebeian people. A tribune would veto. So, veto, I forbid. And so the discussion stops for the day. For the day. If the next day that particular tribune is sick or has another matter of business or is dead, and all of those uh, or enough of those members of the assembly meet again, they can pick up that discussion right where they left off and make the decision. So while the veto is powerful, it's not permanent. Right? It's for a day. It's to take the discussion away for the day. Now, they can come back and veto every day, you know, but if somebody is that big of a thorn in your side, you're going to find a way to get rid of them. And we'll be talking about a case just like that coming up soon. Okay, so we are discussing Roman identity. And this is how the Romans would have seen themselves as a group of people. It is uh, their culture. It's their way of life. It's all of these things blended together. Uh, we call it the Mos Maiorum, or the customs of the ancestors, and that's a big part of this. Uh, so their culture, religion, laws, all of these things are pooled together. Well, one of those elements is something known as pietas, which is um, like dutifulness or faithfulness. And you can see in this image um, here right above me, you see Aeneas carrying his father Anchises. Aeneas is the, uh, the Trojan hero coming out of the Trojan War. Now, if you remember when we discussed this in ancient Greece, or well, we talked about ancient Greece, the Trojan War is a conflict between the the Greeks, essentially the Achaeans, and the people of Troy. Aeneas is one of the Trojan heroes who will take up the sword of Troy and lead the the Trojans out of the city as it burns behind them uh, to go settle a new land, which will eventually be Rome, according to their uh, kind of foundational myths. So in this image, you see Aeneas carrying his father, kind of showing that filial piety, that dutifulness to the father. Patria potestas, or kind of the uh, laws of the father, uh, or the power of the father, that's the idea of this, this kind of institutionalized patriarchy that existed in Rome. Um, that it's the uh, kind of treated like a father-child relationship. In fact, the elders of the city Right, they're they're called patricians, right? Pater, father. Um, this is uh, this is something that we see throughout Roman culture. And if you talk about, um, you know, even the ways that government's set up, or you look at the look at the story of um, Lucrezia, right? Lucrezia, um, and and uh, the the um, rape by Tarquin. Uh, or Tarquinius Superbus, right? she kills herself uh, out of honor, right? because that's that's what was expected of her. Um, the priesthood and, and Roman society, and that's um, they're they're very closely linked. In fact, holding a position of priesthood or uh, or some type of power like that in Roman society was almost necessary. Uh, and then we have patronymics, so. Um, you know, kind of the uh, male element of naming. Uh, first of all, Roman names are often in three. You'll see them extend um, further too. But but most of the the famous um, people that we would talk about have three names, right? So if you think of someone like like we would call him Caesar or even Julius Caesar, but his name is Gaius Julius Caesar. Cicero, the famous orator, is Marcus Tullius Cicero. Right, so these names mean different things. So Marcus, for example, is his given name. Right, so Marcus Tullius Cicero, his parents gave him the name Marcus. Tullius is his family name. Right, so he's a member of the Tullii. So, so, so that would be like his, you know, his his last name uh, or, or surname for us. And then Cicero is a nickname. So Cicero actually means chickpea, um, so that, that's where you know, what his name is, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Women are often named for their fathers. Um, so uh, if your name is Julius, your daughter will be Julia. If your name is Octavian, your daughter would be Octavia. 
Um, so the, those, um, those traditions are even still seen today. Uh, and then slaves would actually have personal names or names that they give themselves. Uh, and they're really the only ones that have that um, because that's, that's, you know, part of, um, you know, they're not going to be given those family names uh, or part of that, that triple naming element that the actual Roman citizens would have. Okay, so let's discuss the Punic Wars. So the Punic Wars are a series of wars in which Rome expands throughout the Mediterranean and asserts their own uh, influence and dominance in the region. So uh, the Punic Wars are battles essentially between the Romans and the Carthaginians, um, which are a group of people from North Africa, um, essentially Phoenicians, uh, living in this colony of Carthage. Uh, and so we we call them in this the, the Punic Wars um, because that's what the Romans would have called the Carthaginians. They didn't call them Carthaginians like we do uh, because Carthage was just the city. The, the people were the Punici or the Phoenicians, so Punic Wars. Um, so this gets into one of the discussions I often have with my, my students um, because you see images of... Um, like these these Phoenicians, these these Carthaginians, um, in in Roman sculpture and what they look like, and uh, same with you know the the pharaohs of Egypt at this time. Um, you know it's important to remember that they are at least here the uh, Carthaginians are Phoenician, so they are Middle Eastern. Um, they would have kind of like that uh, that maybe a um, like a tan skin complexion, uh, dark hair, dark eyes. Um, and the Egyptians, for example, uh, were Greek. At least the pharaohs were Greek. So when you see Cleopatra come up, Cleopatra is going to have very pale skin, uh, kind of like that olive color maybe, um, and the kind of dark, uh, uh, dark hair, light eyes. That's going to go with Cleopatra. We often look at this and and see well you know well they're in they're in um you know europe they have to look a certain way they're in africa they have to look a certain way they're they're in asia they have to look a certain way and it's just not the way the world works and it's not the way it works today um it's important to remember that not only did these um did these communities shift but they were, were rather homogenous when they did shift to a location so um, North Africa for a long period is populated by people of Middle Eastern descent. You have the Phoenicians here. Later you will have uh, the Berbers that come from the Middle East and populate the region. Um, and even today, were you to go to Egypt, uh, Egypt is a predominantly Middle Eastern style population. Um, it's the largest Muslim nation in the world. So you're going to see, um, see those uh, cultures and those um, uh, ethnicities present there. Anyway, I bring that up uh, because I often get comments that you know the Romans did their sculptures wrong or, uh, or or things such as that. But in reality, it's it's often pop culture that um, misinterprets those. So, like we said, Carthage is a colony of the Phoenicians. It's located in North Africa, uh, near modern day Tunisia, and this is a very very wealthy province. Um, iron trade, the city itself was quite powerful. Uh, and and what, I, what I love is you can see in this image here, I'll just kind of highlight it for you. The harbor of Carthage is I think probably one of the most incredible uh, things that was ever built. So it's this kind of round harbor here with this channel that's connected to it. So the way this worked was kind of twofold. So you essentially had this central island um, that would have been in control. So this is like the control tower for an airport. Inside here are where your military ships would be docked. Out here is your commercial harbor. So ships that are trading would come in here. No one's allowed to pass here unless they're a military ship. If you are an enemy ship, it's uh, 
let's just give ourselves a little, little Roman boat out here. Yes, my, my artwork has not improved. It's not one of the skills that I've worked on during the pandemic. So you got your little Roman ship out here. They can't see what's going on inside the harbor. These ships couldn't be mobilizing for war. These commercial ships can be being cleared out of the way. And no one knows. Now, if you're a warship coming out of here, you have all of this speed, all of this distance to get up to that speed, right? Because these ships are driven mainly by rowers. And instead of like a normal port, say if there was a dock here where you kind of untie the ship and then you have to get up to speed, they have all that time hidden, concealed to do that. And they come out of this this harbor just lightning fast, uh, ready, to, ready to attack. Because that's how fighting was done by ships, right? It's not about pulling up next to one another and fighting. It's about ramming into your ship. So, so your power comes from another ship being able to row into the side and break a ship open, essentially. Okay, so the First Punic War um, had a lot to do with the island of Sicily. And so I, I always think this is interesting. If you remember when we discussed... Um, uh, like the Allied invasion of Italy uh, during World War II, the Allies invaded from North Africa into Sicily and eventually into Italy. It's kind of the reverse of what happens here. So um, if we take a look at our map here, so the um, the city of Messenia, which is right here, um, was under the impression that they were going to be taken over by the Carthaginians. And you can see Carthage controls a little bit of the Iberian Peninsula, what's today Spain, as well as the Balearic Islands, Corsica, Sardinia, most of Sicily. So since the, the um, Romans don't want the Carthaginians that close, and the Messenians don't want to be taken over by the Carthaginians, the Messenians look to Rome for help. Um, Essentially, the, this turns into a naval battle between the Carthaginians and the Romans, which goes pretty poorly for the Romans until a Carthaginian ship ends up kind of stuck on the rocks. And the Carthaginian sailors abandon the ship, expecting it to sink, but it doesn't. Uh, and the Romans find it, and they're able to kind of tow it back to shore and tear it apart and reverse engineer it. Now, if the Romans are good at one thing, it's engineering. They're masters at building things. And so they tear the ship apart, see how it's supposed to be built, and just kind of recreate it on an assembly line. They build a dozen of these ships. Now, this ship that the Carthaginians used is something called a quincurine. So it actually um, had multiple layers of, of rowing decks, made it extremely fast. Right? A trireme, which was kind of the, the normal, had three tri. A quincurine had five rows of, of uh, or, or banks of, of rowers, so much faster ships. Now, uh, the Romans are going to use this to their advantage. They're going to turn around and actually be able to win this war. Um, and so as part of their victory, they take the islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and they're going to take Sicily as well. Not only that, Carthage is going to have to pay a war indemnity, right? Kind of a, um, a fine for starting the war. And that's going to go to the Romans. So Rome gains money and territory uh, out of this particular conflict. Okay, so the Second Punic War is a little bit different, and you'll notice it starts a bit later. Um, since Carthage had lost those islands uh, during the First Punic War, they are trying to recover their wealth. So to recover their wealth, uh, the Carthaginians actually send the guy who, who was in charge of that first um, defensive of the Carthaginians, uh, a guy named, um, I think his name was uh, uh, Hamilcar. Um, and they send him to Spain. And in Spain, he's able to conquer quite a bit of territory, gain some money, uh, but eventually he's going to be killed. 
Now his son, Hannibal, Hannibal Barca, becomes famous for, first of all, for defending the city of Saguntum from Roman aggression. And then he follows the Romans up into Gaul, up into the Alps, across the Alps, down into Italy. So he actually invades Italy itself. Now he does this with elephants. This is always the famous story, right? That, that Hannibal was able to invade Carthage um, or in, invade Rome with these Carthaginian elephants, these giant African war elephants, and go and fight against the Romans. And he did. Now, you know, the story is he set out with something like 20 or 30 elephants, but, but I think only... Um, only somewhere in the, the neighborhood of two or three ever actually made it to Italy. Anyway, uh, Hannibal is one of these famous figures because he never loses a battle uh, un until he loses the last one, right? So the famous one is the Battle of Cannae, or the Battle of Cannae, where I think he um, he might have been outnumbered, um, you know, some some thousands. Uh, I, I want to say it was some 20,000 to like 90,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and, and like 60,000 Romans are killed in this battle. And Hannibal wins. Um, Rome will end up defeating Carthage, though, because a guy by the name of Scipio Africanus, he gets that name later, uh, Scipio, the general, is going to watch Hannibal, study him, and then turn his tactics against him. Scipio, you can see down here, takes his army and attacks Carthage with it. All right, so he attacks the Carthaginians as Zama. Now, when he does this, Hannibal has to go home. He can't stay fighting around in Italy. He's got to go home with the army and defend you know, his homeland. So he's going to leave Italy as well to go back and he's actually going to lose to Scipio here uh, and that's what's one going to make Scipio quite famous to uh, going to lead to Hannibal's eventual suicide uh, Carthage out of this is going to lose Spain so they, they end up having to give their control of Spain over to the Romans uh, and then they're going to have to give up uh, even more money to the Romans and on top of that they have to give up their navy right the thing that made Carthage special has to go to the to the Romans as well so Carthage is is really left with with almost uh, nothing by the end of this in fact they're not even allowed to to manufacture weapons for their own defense uh, without permission from Rome so they're really left with nothing by the end of the Second Punic War okay so this conflict uh, actually occurred at the same time that the Romans were fighting against the Carthaginians in the Second Punic War. So the Greeks wanted to get in on this action, and a guy by the name of Philip V from Macedon, and that name might seem familiar, but he's not actually directly related. Uh, remember, Alexander's empire was divided up. Uh, part of the Macedonian empire went to... One of his generals this is a later descendant of that who's pulling on the same uh, regnal numbers and names but um the the uh macedonians are going to side with the carthaginians and try to defeat the romans rome sent an uh, army over um and you know there's quite a bit of fighting and and there's a um a greek historian by the name of polybius uh, who actually becomes a hostage held in Rome. And that's one of the reasons we have so much history for the Romans is because this guy Polybius was writing about it. Um, but but anyway, the, the Romans are going to defeat the Greeks uh, in, in a couple key battles and take over the, the Greek territories during this war. All right, the third and final Punic War. And you'll notice this this comes almost 50 years later. Um, really, at this point, at the time that this uh, this war starts, uh, Carthage is pretty much nothing. It's nothing more, um, really, than probably uh, this territory right here, just around the city of Carthage. Uh, there's really not much left to it. And there's a Roman senator, uh, a guy by the name of Cato, who 
really distrusts the Carthaginians. Uh, he believes that Carthage needs to be taken care of once and for all. Um, and the Roman people, for the most part, would have agreed with him. They had a pretty strong hatred for Carthage in general, um, and most of the people wanted to see this kind of longtime enemy dealt with. What's interesting about Cato is as a senator, he had a lot of power, but he would also um, you know, give speeches. And so during these speeches, and it didn't matter what it was about, right? He could give a speech on immigration. He could give a speech on, um, on like healthcare, um, on taxes, on road construction, on schools. Every speech was supposed to have ended the same way. He would utter this phrase, Ceterum autem Kenso Carthagena Messe Delendum. And furthermore, I believe Carthage must be destroyed. That's kind of cryptic, isn't it? Um, so what ends up happening is Cato leads a group of kind of inspectors, right? Think about the, the UN inspectors that, that go into countries to check and see if they have chemical weapons or nuclear power or something like that. So Cato takes these troops, right, with him for this inspection, a significant number of troops. Now, his reasoning behind this is that he's expecting to find something to start a war with Carthaginians. So when the Carthaginians look out and they see that the Romans are coming and the Romans are bringing troops with them, their natural response is Rome's coming to destroy us. So they start to manufacture weapons. And this is one of the first cases where we see total war by civilization, right? Every person who could stand was given a weapon. Women cut their hair off to be woven into bowstrings. I mean, every element of Carthaginian life was put to the test for warfare. Every scrap of jewelry that they had, uh, every piece of metal from their homes was fashioned into weapons. Everything they had, they put it to the test one last time. The Romans show up and in a matter of just a few years, destroy the walls of Carthage, break into the city, kill all the men, all the soldiers, enslave anyone who survives, and burn the city to the ground. They raise it. And not only that, of course, according to legend, they then plow the ground under with salt so that nothing will ever grow there again. Now, that last bit probably isn't true since the Romans will actually rebuild Carthage later themselves. But the story's nice, right? It tells us just how much hatred they had for those Carthaginians. But after this, Rome is going to control pretty much the entire Mediterranean. The only, only piece of the Mediterranean that's left is Egypt. And don't worry, they'll add that to their mantle soon enough. Now, we've been going on about this Roman Republic for a while. Um, when you think about it, that last war that we were just discussing, it ended in the 140s. So at that point, the Republic's 350 years old. Uh, that's over 100 years longer than our country has been around. So the Roman Republic uh, comes to an end because they fail to reform. Uh, they, they don't change whenever there needs to be changes. There is a, a gap between the rich and the poor. The military starts to break down. Uh, troops become you know, more loyal to their commanders than they are to the actual republic itself. There is um, an increase in wealth and land for the upper class, which leads to farmers being upset. And uh, the addition of slavery into agriculture really kind of slows down uh, that process for these small farmers. And, I, and I'll go into that. Uh, we'll kind of tackle each of these pieces of time. So uh, the first thing is the Latifundia, these Roman estate farms. So they operate based on slave labor. Um, and if you want to think about this in terms of something you might be more familiar with, picture a small farm, right? A family farm run by, you know, the family and, and some maybe some friends or a few hired workers. You've got, I don't know, 10 people running this farm. And then you look at these massive farms out in the Midwest, you know, that are, that are um, machine operated and they have thousands and thousands of acres. One can't compete with the other, right? It just can't. These Roman latifundia worked in kind of the same way in the ancient sense, right? So these aren't family-owned farms. A powerful family might own several of these latifundia, but they're all operated based off of slave labor. 
And the slaves cost them nothing because they win them in military conquest and they certainly don't take care of them, right? So the slave population makes up around 60% of the Roman population at its height. And since small farmers cannot compete with that, they have to give up farming, right? They, they can't make a living. So they give up their farming and they pack up their, their belongings and move to the city. Now you've got two problems here. One, these powerful estate farmers are going to buy up that, that small farm that's now gone and add it to their collection. And since many of these farmers are becoming unemployed, they're moving to the city. There's only so many jobs. So when these farmers all move to the city, there's now no jobs for anyone. So that leads to overcrowding in the city, rampant unemployment, and you're going to have these homeless, jobless farmers just kind of um, becoming derelict in the streets. It, it really puts Rome to the test at this point. Now, when we deal with slavery in the ancient world, of course, we've talked about this before with the, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, and etc. Slavery is not something that's new. It's not something that's unique. Um, but in some places, it is more brutal than in others. Rome was known for its brutality towards slaves. Um, both agricultural slaves and kind of the household slaves. Slavery is, is mainly brutal because it's one of the times where these slaves are not seen as people. They're treated as commodities, right? They're bought and sold uh, on a whim, and, and most of them are used in, in actual labor, right? They are, um, are workers. There are some who are trusted to be kind of servants or business operators. Of course, there's the gladiatorial slaves, and then there's some who are given more menial or belittling tasks, right? There's some who um, who have slaves simply to follow them around and provide shade, right? That's a very belittling task, and that undermines some of those parts of the most maiorum, right? The the customs of the ancestors. So Rome's kind of having this social breakdown as well. Now. As this new money comes in, people become particularly wealthy. The patriarchy starts to weaken. Women are able to gain more influence, more power in Roman society. Women get the ability to initiate divorce, which was new. They're able to control their own wealth and property. Slavery is actually helping women out because it's taking away from what they used to have to do in the home. And it's providing them with this free time so they can step outside of those traditional roles. A lot of them start to, to read, especially Greek literature, um, and they're influenced by a lot of those Hellenistic ideals and start to live life more as uh, free women, as individuals, than just as, as wives or homemakers. All right, these two wonderful gentlemen before you are known collectively as the Gracchi brothers, or Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. So if you remember when we talked about Scipio Africanus, these are his grandsons, and they're tribunes, right? So they, they are part of that legislative branch that has the power to veto. One of the things that these two are trying to do is they were making an attempt to limit the size of those Roman latifundia, those estates. They wanted to essentially divide them up. So if you are thinking about uh, a Roman estate, for example, Right, so so let's say that a a Roman estate is this represented by this square here, or I guess a, a rectangle rather. Right? So they don't want to take it all away. But what they do want is they want to maybe take maybe half of it. And then they want to subdivide that half and give some of that land to those poor farmers. That way, the wealthy still have more land, but those poor farmers are given land so they can get out of the Roman cities, stop overcrowding, and start giving back. But who's not going to like this idea? right? The wealthy farmer who used to own all of that, that wealthy Roman uh, who used to have all of that land. He's upset because he's losing land. Now, the Gracchi thought this was a great idea because when you give that land back, it gives back that element of land ownership to these people, making them a part of the Republic again, qualifying them for military service again. But 
those wealthy that disagreed uh, would not allow this to happen. So Tiberius Gracchus is actually going to be clubbed to death for this, and his brother Gaius is going to be forced to commit suicide over it. So these ideas are not going to to go into effect the way they had hoped, at least not not immediately, because Rome is going to fall into a civil war right after their deaths. So this civil war that I mentioned is between two individuals, a guy named Gaius Marius, uh, who you can see you know, down here in the bottom, bottom right, so we'll just put an M there for Marius, and Lucius Sulla up here, we'll put an S next to him so you know him. Now, Marius is the son of a plebeian farmer. He's a general in the Roman army. He's kind of worked himself um, up to that position of power. He's elected as a consul, and he actually holds that consulship six times, which is illegal, but, you know, people allowed him to get away with it. Marius is a person who recognizes the power of the Roman military. So he actually gets rid of the land requirement for soldiers and basically offers all these jobless farmers hey look if you want to join the military you know it's 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 a it's a place to sleep it's a paycheck uh come on in and he just inflates the ranks of his army and who are they thankful to are they thankful to the republic for providing them with this opportunity or are they thankful to marius for providing them this opportunity right his soldiers become loyal to him lucius sulla who is a patrician general the guy in the top um, he wanted a command in Asia, and it's denied. Um, Sulla is going to be in this war with, with Marius, and he's going to eventually become the, vic the victor and install himself as dictator in Rome. Um, now he makes himself dictator. That's an appointed office. The Senate is supposed to give that up. So we've got both sides breaking laws to kind of accomplish their means here. Now, these three gentlemen come along shortly after the Mari and Sulla uh, civil war, and they're known as the first triumvirate. So let's look at that word, triumvirate. Uh, so there's several parts here, right? So the tri, or trium, is three. And weir, in Latin, is man. So a rule by three men. You have uh, three men before you, right? So over here on the uh, the left, <clears throat> you have a guy named uh, Marcus Unius Crassus. This is Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or uh, probably most commonly known as Pompey. And Gaius Julius Caesar. So Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus are three men who are kind of working in the shadows to be successful during this period. Crassus is extraordinarily wealthy. Pompey is well known and Caesar is ambitious. And that's kind of these these three guys' backstory. So so quickly, Crassus became really rich in kind of a shady way. He started a fire company. Um, and so if your house is on fire, Crassus would show up and go, I can put that out for you for a fee. And people, of course, their home burning would agree, and he'd put out the fire and then wait to collect his money. You know, that's kind of a, a poor way, but he, of course, then invests money, and he's able to become quite wealthy. Uh, Pompey is famous for his wars in the Middle East. He becomes quite powerful, and he's also just kind of a well-known figure. Caesar is famous, of course, most famous at least, for his conquest of Gaul, and we'll get to that. But um, Pompey wants to hold uh, the authority that Sulla once did. So he's elected consul, and he's elected consul by himself. Um, he's sort of jealous of the power that Caesar has, because Caesar's up in Gaul, uh, and he essentially controls all of Gaul. Uh, he's the governor of that territory. So, and, and Gaul, by the way, is modern-day France. So he's controlling a country larger than, than Italy, uh, where Pompey is. And so Pompey's jealous of that power. So Pompey convinces the, the Senate to declare 
uh, Caesar, an enemy of the state, and orders him to return to Rome and surrender his army. Crassus is pretty much out of the story by this point because, well, he had actually died, but um, but and that's really what, what the downfall of a triumvirate is, right? When you have three bodies, you can kind of two versus one pull someone back under control. When it's just two, it becomes a power struggle. So one person is going to win. Now, Caesar does not listen to that order that Pompey gives. Um, he defies the Senate, and on January 10th, 49 BC, he crosses the Rubicon River, which is a river up in northern Italy that marks the boundary of Rome. And he does so with his army in tow, essentially declaring war on Rome. He brings the 13th Legion into Rome itself um, and in a threatening way, is kind of preparing to fight against Pompey. And he's supposed to have said, uh, the, or, or you know, uttered the phrase, alia yacta est, which means the die is cast, right? What will be, will be. Pompey, seeing Caesar coming with his battle-hardened troops, takes off, goes to Greece, um, and starts to gather up an army, and then, of course, there's a civil war that ensues. Now, Here's where that becomes even more messy. Pompey is defeated at Pharsalus and is going to go to Egypt instead. So he hides out in Alexandria. Alexandria is the capital of Egypt at this point. Now, Egypt was actually in a civil war of its own at that time. Cleopatra, who you see here next to Caesar in this image, was fighting with her brother slash husband, Ptolemy XIII. Ptolemy wants to make Caesar happy. Right? He wants to please Julius Caesar. He sees that he knows he's coming after Pompey with this army. He had invited Pompey in, into protection in Egypt, and he knows Caesar's coming. He wants to be on the winning side of this, so he kills Pompey to make Caesar happy. Now, this enrages Caesar because Pompey was like his best friend. Even if they were at war with one another, he certainly didn't want some outsider killing him. Right, Only I'm allowed to beat up my little brother kind of thing. And so he works with Cleopatra to take out her brother, Ptolemy. Caesar's going to return to Rome in triumph, which is not actually like just victory. There's a special parade uh, where you would kind of parade all of the wealth and your, your, your captured troops and uh, the slaves and everything before you. And you're allowed to kind of bring your army into the city with weapons in tow. It's a very special ceremony in Rome, and it's reserved only for certain victorious generals. He's appointed dictator for 10 years. Um, he extends citizenship to people all throughout Rome. And in 44 BC, Caesar is made dictator for life. Right, So that's a position that's only supposed to be held for six months. He's given it for life. So it's basically just throwing away everything that the Senate had in giving that power essentially just to Caesar. Now... Caesar also has a relation with Cleopatra. They have a child together named Caesarian, who will be pharaoh of Egypt for a half a minute. Um, and he, you know, they have their own thing going on there, but she stays in Egypt and he goes back to Rome. So Rome, the Roman people, for the most part, love Caesar. He gives citizenship to people in the provinces, he expands the Senate, he doubles it actually, he takes it from 300 to 600 members, fills it with his allies so they're not going to argue with anything he does. Uh, he creates a lot of jobs, hands out uh, money and food to the poor, he increases the pay that his soldiers receive, which you know is good for him because those soldiers are going to be on his side. But his popularity and his power bothers the Senate, right? The Senate sees him as, as being a, a dictator, essentially. They see him as having too much wealth, uh, too much power, and uh, maybe even a step beyond dictator, maybe a king, which is just all that much worse. So Caesar had been warned to beware the Ides of March, right? Idos Martia, the 15th of March, actually, um, that um, that something bad was going to happen. And it turns out that these senators, a group of senators, had planned to assassinate Julius Caesar. Those assassins were led by uh, Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius. Now, if you remember that name, Brutus, that's the same family name as the guy who assassinated the final 
or, or, or fought against the final king of Rome, Tarquinius Superbus. So that's kind of part of that Brutus legacy. On March 15th, the year 44 BC, Caesar is stabbed to death uh, on the, the Senate chamber's floor, or sort of. It's not actually the Roman Senate. It was uh, like Pompey's theater, I believe. But, um, but they were using it as the Senate in that, in that time period um, because there was sort of a, a renovation going on. So he's essentially sort of locked in, and they just lay to him with knives. Uh, it creates a power vacuum. Civil war is going to break out in Rome again. Uh, and one of these figures uh, that's kind of most important at this point is a guy named Mark Antony. Mark Antony was Caesar's master of horse, uh, his best friend, and one of his most trusted generals. And he's actually, he discovers this plot to assassinate Caesar just moments before it happens. He goes rushing to save him just as the kind of gate is dropped in front of him and he gets to watch Caesar be assassinated, but there's nothing he can do. Then Brutus makes a kind of public declaration about what has happened, explaining, you know, why he had to kill Caesar. And then Mark Antony is allowed to speak and um, kind of clear up uh, his position on things. And uh, William Shakespeare captures this in his, his, uh, his play, Julius Caesar. I'll read you um, Mark Antony's speech from that. He says, <clears throat> Friends, Romans and countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often buried with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all honorable men. Come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my best friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious. Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this, in Caesar, seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and, sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Right, so, so Mark Antony was kind of warned not to say anything negative about Brutus, Cassius, and, and uh, he gives this, this funeral oration for Caesar, but it gives you an idea of what he thought of Caesar or what he probably thought of Caesar, and what the general public probably thought of Caesar. That, uh, you know, maybe everything he did wasn't good, but he certainly was helping out the common people of Rome, or it appeared that way. Um, and those assassins, well, they're going to pay for this. All right, until next time, have a good one.